Before I begin, I want to share with you a conviction that has come to me this week. I became exposed to a book by a German Adventist author named Helmut Heibels. It's entitled Steps to Personal Revival, Being Filled with the Holy Spirit. As you can tell, the theme of our service today is the Holy Spirit. I believe if you are truly a seeker to be filled with the Holy Spirit, you will be greatly blessed by this book. It is available online for free. Uh, Amazon has sold out of it over 600,000 copies. It seems to be going like wildfire. wildfire. Uh, I have a link on the sheet of paper available at the hostess desk if you'd like to get it. You can download it for free. You'll find it a great blessing. But we are living, I think all of us recognize that, in times that test our faith. If there was ever a time that we needed God's personal blessing inside of our lives, it's now. Imagine, if you would, that you're walking down the street and suddenly you're caught by total surprise and you look up and you've come face to face with Jesus. In that moment when your eyes meet, the spiritual power of his presence pierces deep into your soul and you feel that every barrier of self-deception, pride, defense, and pretense has been stripped from you. In an instant, you cry out to God, Jesus, what would you have me to do? And with tender love and compassion, he looks deep into your soul and declares, I have come that you might have life and you might have it more abundantly. I want to live within your heart and mind. I want to be one with you. And just as quickly as he appeared, he disappears. In that moment, you feel deep separation and loss. Then your mind recalls that you're not the first to feel the anguish over his leaving, because the disciples themselves expressed separation and anxiety when Jesus left them. You think of the text in John 16, 5 to 7 that says, But now, and this is Jesus speaking, But now I go away with him who has sent me, and none of you ask me, Where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But I, if I depart, I will send him to you. And then you remember again another chapter, another in verse in John 14, 16 to 18. And I will pray the Father and he will send you another Helper that he may abide with you forever, the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him and he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. And then later in that chapter in verse 26, but the Helper and the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things to bring to your remembrance all things that I have said to you. Now let's look at these promises that Jesus made. First, the Holy Spirit will take Jesus' place within you. Secondly, the Holy Spirit will bring Jesus' presence to you. 
Then the Holy Spirit will teach Jesus truths to you. Sadly, we seldom think of the presence of the Holy Spirit on such personal and direct reality. In fact, many pastors and the theologians believe that the understanding of the Holy Spirit is greatly lacking. The early Adventist theologian Leroy Froome said, I am concerned that the lack of the Holy Spirit is our worst problem. And the theologian Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones stated, if I may give my honest opinion, then there is no topic in the Bible belief that has been so neglected in the past or present as the topic of the Holy Ghost. It is the cause for weakness in evangelical faith. And then the great theologian A.W. Tozer said, if the Holy Ghost were taken away from our church today, 95% of what we, would con we, we do would continue and no one would notice the difference. If the Holy Ghost had been withdrawn from the early church, then 95% of what they were doing would have stopped and everyone would have noticed the difference. Well, Jesus said, he's sending his helper to each one of us to fill us with power and to live, to live and to share his witness. And that's the promise that Jesus has for each one of us today. We need to connect with him in order to have power. There's a story of a missionary, his name was Herbert Jackson. He'd been given a car to do his work and he went to this mission field. There was, and it was a great asset to him, but there was one problem that he had is that he couldn't get the car to start. And so he would have to have the car pushed in order to start it. And so what he would do is every morning uh, he would have the kids from the school come over and give him a push so he could get going. And he'd go out and all through his day, he would either leave the car running or park it on a hill so they'd get rolling and he could get it started. And uh, eventually his health failed and he had to go home. So another missionary came to take his place. And of course he left the car for that man and explained to him how the car wouldn't work. And so the man looked under the hood Took a look at it. He said, well, Dr. Jackson, I believe the only trouble here is a loose cable. He wiggled it and twisted it, and he turned the switch, and the engine roared and started right up. For two years, Dr. Jackson had used his own devices to solve his problem, but the power of the car to run it was there all the time. He just didn't have it connected. I think there's a lesson for us today. If we want to have the power of Jesus' life in us, we need to be connected. Charles Spurgeon, the great preacher, said, without the Spirit of God, we can do nothing. We're like sailing ships without the wind, branches without sap, and like coals without fire. We're useless. The Holy Spirit it was Jesus' parting gift to each one of us. It wasn't just promised to the evangelists and the preachers, but to each one of us. In order to have it, we need to long for it. We need to ask for it. One of the co-founders of our church, Ellen White, described it this way. The Holy Spirit is Christ's representative, but divested of personality, of humanity, and independent thereof. Cumbered with humanity, Jesus could not be in every place personally. Therefore, it was for their interest that he should go to the Father and send the Spirit to be his successor here on earth. No one could have any advantage because of his location and his personal contact with Christ. By the Spirit, the Savior could be accessible to all. In his sense, he would be nearer to them than if he had ascended on high. Just imagine 
that Jesus wants to be present in each one of our lives. You see, the disciples recognized in Jesus that there was something very special about his ministry that was different than theirs. They could see the power of God in his ministry. They could see that when he prayed, it changed them. So they came to him, and this is in Luke, the 11th chapter, from which our scripture is taken. They came to him and said, Lord, teach us how to pray. So Jesus said, when you pray, say our Father, which art in heaven. Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. We've all heard and said and repeated that prayer many times. In fact, we're studying it the next number of weeks in Koinonia. There's great riches, richness there. I invite you to come and be part of that. As Shane leads us into a deeper understanding of the Lord's Prayer. But then he adds something very interesting. A story which might make you feel a little uncomfortable. And Jesus said, which of you who has a friend and go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has come to me in, on his journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within and say, Don't trouble me, the door is shut, my children are with me in bed, I cannot rise and give it to you. But listen to Jesus' instructions. I say to you, though he will not rise and give to him because he's his friend, yet because of his persistence, he will rise and give him as many as he needs. Now the word persistent in the New International Version, I love what it says. It says shamelessly, shameless audacity. I mean, would you have the shameless audacity to go to your friend's house at midnight? and knock on the door and keep knocking on the door or maybe worse yet push on the the button for the bell and keep ringing and ringing and ringing and ringing or knocking and knocking until they gave you what you want i think all of us would probably be a little embarrassed about that but listen to what jesus says but i say to you ask and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened unto you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks find, finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If I, if you then, being evil, no, give how to give good gifts to your children. And here's the, here's the crux of the whole passage, all in one verse. How much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask for him? This was not just about prayer. It was about seeking the Holy Spirit in our lives. Now let's look at this prayer again. In the prayer, there are seven petitions to ask from the Lord. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth. Your will be done in heaven. Give us his daily bread, our daily bread. Forgive us our sins. And lead us not into temptation. All the needs we have in our lives, we can ask God to take care of those, whether it's worship to him or a relationship in our physical life. But then he says this amazing thing, the thing that almost seems crazy to us, to go and beat on your neighbor's door and to ask shame with shameless audacity for something that you don't have. The person knocking at the door would not give up until he got what he wanted. What Jesus is saying is don't give up. 
Keep asking. In fact, those latter verses have 10 different ways of describing asking. Asking, seeking, knocking. It's all the same thing, 10 different times. And the capstone is ask for the Holy Spirit. And God doesn't want to hold back at all. He's telling us to get really passionate about seeking him to let go of our pride, not be ashamed, but to seek him with all of our heart. And in the word, in the Greek, for that last sentence where it says ask, it is in the tense that says keep on asking. In other words, continually ask for the Holy Spirit. If you want power to have your life changed, if you want power to share the good news of love with others, it's all there. It's in the Holy Spirit. We need to get serious about asking and seeking and knocking. Dwight Moody, a very famous evangelist, speaking to a large class and, or a crowd, and he held up a glass. And he said, how can I get air out of this gap glass? And someone hollered out from the crowd, uh, you, can take, uh, you can create a vacuum and take it out. And he said, no, but if I do that, I'll shatter the glass. What else? Well, no one came up with an answer. So finally, he took some water and he poured it in. You should see, the air is gone. For us, we may be trying on our own to take the air out of our life, sucking out sin or sucking out anxiety or sucking out pain or sucking out fear but Jesus wants to fill us with his spirit which will give us the living water Jesus Christ he is calling us to trust him so that he can do what we could never do for ourselves the text in Ephesians 3 verse 20 tells us how much he wants to give us. It says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. That's his promise. He's promised that he will do what we ask or think. But even more than that, he wants to exceed what we ask or think. And then he wants to exceed exceedingly abundantly above what we ask or think. But even more than that, to do exceedingly, abundantly all that we ask or think. You see, we can't even get our minds around what God wants to do for us. He wants us to be like a sponge, to reach out from him and let him fill us with the living life of Jesus Christ. In the book Desire of Ages, we have this quote, the promised blessing of the Holy Spirit claimed by faith brings all other blessings in its train. It is given according to the riches of the grace of Christ, and he is ready to supply every soul according to his capacity to receive. Twice on this, we took two vacations, short vacations this year. One, we were in Arizona, the other in Montana. And one thing I noticed out there that I seldom see around here was what we call huge trains. They were like a mile long with over a hundred cars. Can you imagine each car load in the spirit coming to us to be unloaded in our presence with every blessing that God can give according to what we're able to receive? You see, in order for him to pour out his blessing, we must open our hearts and minds to allow him to give us what he's offering us. What might be some of those blessings that we need? Maybe we need the gift of forgiveness because we're encumbered with guilt. Or maybe we have need the gift of holiness to replace our fleshly lusts. Maybe we need the free, gift of freedom to deliver us from our addictions. Maybe we need the gift of peace to deliver us from our fears. 
all in one gift, the Holy Spirit. Jesus is giving us everything we need. A gift to grow in character, to be like Christ, and a gift to share his love with other people. Another statement from you shall receive power. With the reception of the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit, all other gifts will be ours. That's an awesome promise. God is not holding back. Anything that we invite him to give us, he is willing to give. There simply is no end to his blessings. And that last verse in Luke eleven thirteen says, How much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who keep on or continually ask him? Don't give up, friends. He wants to give us everything that we can receive. Jesus himself received daily blessings of the Holy Spirit. In prayer, he sought God each day. Christ Object Lessons, page 146. Our prayers are to be as earnest and persistent as the petition of the needy friend who asks for the loaves at midnight and more earnestly and steadfastly we ask the closer will be our spiritual union, re, union with Christ. We shall receive increased blessings because we have increased faith. So how do we get faith? Well, the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. But sometimes it's not always easy to hear the voice of God. The Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit is a still, small voice. It takes us being quiet, to focus, to listen, to be able to hear. We're counseled in the scripture, be still and know that I am God. The Spirit speaks in the stillness. There's a story told of in the days before refrigerators when people used to make ice houses to preserve food. They had thick walls, no windows, and a tightly fitting door, and the people would go out in the winter and cut big, thick chunks of ice. Sometimes it might be two or three feet thick. and They'd pile it in this ice house, cover it up with sawdust, and it would last often throughout the whole summer. Well, one, one time when a group of men were working in the light in the ice house, a man lost his watch, and the whole crew searched for it. They tried finding it, and they finally gave up and went in and took a break for lunch. And the little boy had an idea. So while they were busy eating, he slipped into the ice house, and a few moments, a few minutes later, he came out with the watch. Everyone was stunned. How did you find it? I closed the door. I laid down on the sawdust, kept very still, and soon I heard the ticking watch. I think that's kind of what we need to do with God. We need to, in quietness, come to him, listen for his spirit to speak to our hearts. Let him come into our heart and mind and let him speak through his word and speak through that still, small voice. We're living in a world where very few people are listening to even each other, let alone God. We are perhaps at the midnight of our world's history. Today, we need Jesus and his Holy Spirit more than ever. Look at the politics of our world and our nation. Division, confusion, animosity, downright hatred. Leaders are threatening the destruction of other nations. And racially, there is anger by individuals openly calling for the killing of each other, be it white or black or different religion, be it Muslim or Christian. 
or even presidents of nations threatening each other. Tensions are escalating in the natural world. We are seeing more worse ever situations, and they're multiplying. In the last two, three, two weeks, we have seen three of the most horrific and destructive hurricanes we've ever experienced, Harvey, Irma, and Maria. This week, we saw an 8.1 earthquake in New Mexico, followed by a 7.1. Over the last 30 to 40 years, we averaged one eight-point earthquake a year worldwide, and only 15 in the seven range. Immediately, within days, two days, or a day even after the uh, 7.1 earthquake, there were two six-range earthquakes on the Pacific Ring of Fire. Then yesterday, a 5.5 in Mexico and a 5.7 across in Northern California off the coast. And this morning, a 6.1 near Mexico City. We've been repeatedly warned, a big one is coming here. We too need to be prepared in our hearts to accept whatever comes. Remember Job. It was the presence of God in his life that made him able to cope with the great losses that he had. And it is the Spirit of God in us that will enable us to deal with what comes before us. Much is happening, whether it's fires, crop failures, mass animal deaths, contentious civil disorder. And yes, even yesterday, a great a warning was given all across the United States, from Northern California to Virginia, of the very real possibility of mosquito infections causing epidemics. Every week when we come to church, there are more serious challenges to our security, safety, and personal faith that require God's protection, power, and presence in our lives. We need the calming of the Holy Spirit, the one and only source of strength that can take us through in this midnight hour is the very presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Surely, the old gospel hymn applies more today than ever before. If we ever needed the Lord before, we sure do need him now. Friends, let's seek the Holy Spirit. Let's ask, let's plead, let's keep on asking. Like a starving and thirsty person, don't give up until you're satisfied that he is there in every aspect. The Holy Spirit comes not where people are hungry for religion or for doctrine, he comes when people are hungry for more of the word, for more of his divine presence, for more of his promises of his help, for more of his will in our lives, so he can fill us to overflowing with more than we can even ask or think, exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ask or think. Or think. Seek him with all your heart, with all your soul. That is my prayer for you today. And just a reminder, if you're interested in getting this free book, the link is at the desk. You can grab it on your way out.